Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's webinar. We've been very lucky to have uh, Sylvie with us. And Sylvie is a professor in reproduction at Toulouse National Veterinary School. Um, she is an absolute expert in her field, and she's currently uh, developing research in the field of canine neonatology and paediatrics. And she works within a really dynamic team called Neocare. So we're really grateful to have her on board and speaking with us tonight on her chosen subject. And we're really focusing this evening on preparing females for pregnancy. And Sylvie will talk us through both the requirements of the bitch and the queen in terms of this stage of reproduction. So just before we start and I hand over to Sylvie a little bit of admin from our side of things. So this evening's seminar should take around an hour to an hour and a half. And after Sylvie, we do have Hannah Poyle with us, who's one of our scientific communications managers in the UK to give us a little bit of uh, a background on nutrition as well. At the end of the evening, we will hopefully, if we have time, do our usual Q&A. So please, as we go through this evening's seminar, if you have any questions for Sylvie or for Hannah, then please do pop them into the chat box for us. And uh, depending on time, we'll see how many of those we can get through as the evening progresses. So we will also be recording this evening's presentation and this will automatically be sent out to you to the email address which you registered with. Give us a chance, it normally comes out around 48 hours after the event and attached to that email will not only be the recording of this evening but will also be your attendance certificates for your CPD requirements as well. So without further ado, I'm going to sit back with my own cup of tea and very much enjoy this presentation and hand over to Sylvie. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yes, I will try to share some information uh, with you on the preparation to females for pregnancy. Um, so. Um, I'm working in Toulouse uh, in the south, uh, southern part of, of France and we are a small group working on uh, mainly neonatology and pediatrics in feline and uh, canine species and also on population medicine and in reproduction since I am a teacher in, uh, in reproduction. So the idea of uh, the presentation was to show you that it's important to Think about uh, reproduction long before um, reproduction itself. So reproduction indeed uh, begins long before pregnancy diagnosis and even long before mating. Meaning that uh, we we what will be addressed during this lecture is what would be important to be done here before uh, programming any reproduction. So meaning that we will talk about what has to be done during the anastrous period and we will go not really during it because I don't want you to expect that I will speak about astrus follow-up and so on. Uh, I really want to stress on the point that it's very important to um, to think about reproduction really very, very early. So why is it necessary to prepare females to reproduction? The first reason is to get them pregnant. The second one is to uh, get an easy whelping or easy kittening. And the third reason, so very, very late, a long-term reason is to optimize the survival of the newborns. Um, this first slide is to share with you the importance of uh, the dam. So we, we conducted uh, several years ago an experiment just in order to uh, identify the risk factor for mortality uh, in puppies. And what was impressive is whatever the period of mortality of the puppy, stillbirth, mortality between zero and two days of life, mortality between three and uh, the end of the third weeks and later uh, during the second month of life. What was interesting is to see that at each 
step, we add a significant effect of a general factor called dam, meaning that depending on the dam they were born from, uh, puppies were more more or less at risk of mortality. So meaning that the dam it has a crucial importance and that's why it's, it's to exemplify that it's very important to prepare the dam in order to have the better one for the puppy's survival. So it, uh, we have to give some words about what is called breeding performance. So this term is usually devoted to bovine or to uh, piglets, to the to swine, but indeed it can also be applied uh, in, a, in the canine or, or in, in the feline species. So the, the idea is that um, um, the, the goal of a breeder whatever is professional or only a private owner, is to have um, the highest number of youngs wind and sold. But it's the end of a very uh, long story, beginning with mating, thereafter pregnancy, whelping, newborns, and thereafter newborn survival. What now, but what is normal, what are normal reproductive performances in the canine and feline species? This question um, is, is very difficult to, um, to, 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 the calculation is not so easy due to the fact that there is no official registration in uh, most countries, but we had the great luck to um, get access to what the result of the breeding management support. It's a software you may know from Royal Canin and uh, we had access to this data for France only and uh, it, we analyzed the result of a great number of matings both for uh, queens and for uh, bitches. And you see that normal reproductive, normal reproductive performances in queens are that nearly 80% of mated queens finally queen. There is around four kittens born per queening and at the end only 3.3 kittens alive at the age of two months. If we have a look to what happens with um, bitches, we have the same figure around 80% of bitches whelping, a mean prolificacy of 5.4 puppies born, and at the end, uh, a prolificacy of 4.6 puppies alive at the age of two months. So at that time, uh, Royal Canin is developing a new software to which we contributed called uh, Royal Start. And thanks to Royal Start, it will be possible to um, get the same type of figures for uh, other countries and to have them on an even higher number of, uh, of females. So we will obtain really very in interesting uh, information. So it would just to give you another look to what could be expected as, as a reproductive efficacy uh, in, in, um, in the canine and in the feline species. To give you a comparison, for example, with, uh, with bovine, um, in, in bovine only um, 37 to 40 percent of the cows inseminated finally calf and for for human it's even worse because it's only uh, 25 percent meaning that the reproductive efficacy of uh, queen and and bitches is not so bad but the objective for us as uh, veterinarians is to optimize this reproductive performance and one key step is the preparation to reproduction. So here you can find a flower to, to show you uh, the agenda of the lecture. So we will go through these various factors uh, that could be controlled to optimize reproduction.
So the first element is the choice of the breed. So obviously as vets, we do not have a great influence on that factor because this factor is only chosen by the breeder who has a beloved breed and there is no discussion. But it's nevertheless important to show to uh, the owner that there are some differences between reproductive performances of the various breeds. Uh, so I gave you here also coming from uh, the breeding, breeding management support, uh, the 10 more represented breeds. Uh, and uh, you have here the whelping rates. So you can see that between French Bulldog and uh, for example, uh, Shih Tzu, you have a 10 points difference. For prolificacy also, obvi oh, sorry, obviously, uh, there are really important differences. And it is also the case for uh, mortality rate. Depending on breed, you can have um, a stillbirth rate uh, multiplied by a factor two here. From here to here, you have the same situation for postnatal mortality, meaning the mortality of puppies born alive, but dying within the two first months of life. And at the end, you see also very important differences in the total mortality rate, meaning stillbirth rate plus postnatal mortality. And uh, we have the same situation for the feline species with huge difference in fertility, meaning the percentage of queens, uh, of, of mated queens that finally uh, queen at the end. So you see that if you ha are here in Bengal, this, you have a 10 point difference with uh, the kittening rate of ragdoll, for example. And what, and there is also a huge impact of the breed on the mortality rate. Here you see a 10 person global mortality rate in Norwegian, whereas you are close to 22 points in British short hair. But Okay, we can't do anything. But for the second factor that is very important is to um, give advice to the owner uh, about the age at which the dam is um, uh, mated. So with, with the same ty type of data, we analyze the effect of the age of the beach on the whelping rate. And you can see that the whelping rate of the beach is slightly less when the female is mated at the it is mated before the age of one year. And thereafter, there is a plateau around here between the age of two years until the age of six years, and thereafter uh, the whelping rate tends to decrease. The situation is uh, slightly different in um, Queens, in which we didn't succeed to evidence any influence of the dam's age, even when we were considering um, a Queens before the age of one year. So the two spaces are not totally identical. If we have a look to the effect of the age of the female, and its impact on prolificacy. Here I share with, with you a very interesting study made in Norway uh, with a very large number of litters in which it's a, a statistical projection, but it's very interesting. And you can see that first there is an effect of the breed size on prolificacy, meaning that the, the tallest is the breed uh, the highest is the prolificacy. But you can see that whatever the breed size, the prolificacy is slightly lower for uh, bitches at the age of one. Uh, 
Thereafter, you have a plateau between the age of two to around six years, and thereafter, the prolificity decreases, and the decrease is much more important in large and giant breeds compared to what could be seen in small and mini breeds, for example. Uh, considering queens, here we it has been done also with uh, BMS data, and you see that there is a, a steady state decrease of the prolificacy of queens uh, with uh, the age, meaning that the youngest is the queen, uh, the, the highest is the prolificacy. And the decrease, the difference is very important because you are losing uh, nearly 25% of a litter between year. The, the youngest queens of one and two years, and thereafter, the, um, here the queens older than six years, because here we, we have lost nearly one kitten out of four. Uh, what is also interesting is to have a look to the effect of the dam's age on uh, the mortality of puppies or kittens. Uh, I like this one, because uh, you, it's, it's a, a graph that demonstrates that it's very important to uh, get a bitch pregnant as early as possible in her life in order to decrease the mortality. Um, in blue, no, we'll begin by, by, by the green uh, column. Here you have uh, the mortality rate um, of, uh, of the first week of life if the female whelps for the first time at the age of one year, if she whelps for the first time at the age of two years, or if she whelps at the first time uh, at the age of three or four. So, Comparing these four uh, bars, it's easy to understand that if you want to get your bitch pregnant, it's very important that the first whelping occurs as early as possible. If you wait, you will dramatically increase the mortality rate of the puppies. Um, and uh, so, and, and it's the same uh, story for the second parity, meaning that if you are breeding your female for the first time at the age of one year, but that if the second whelping occurs only at the age of five, you can see that the mortality rate is also dramatically increased. Um, if we consider what uh, is happening in Queens, you have um, here the total mortality for the very young females. There is a slight decrease um, for the uh, adult queens between the age of one to five years, and thereafter a slight increase. But if you compare my two uh, graphs, here you see very huge differences in, in the canine. Um, the mortality rate is increased uh, from 10% to 25%, whereas here the difference between these very young queens to this one to these ones are is only uh, around three points. So the situation is far different, meaning that globally the influence of age is much more important in uh, the beach than in the queen. So thereafter, I will not speak a long time about national breeding restriction, but it was just to exemplify the fact that um, here, for example, in the UK, it's also um, not advised, but indeed forbidden to breed 
uh, a bit after the age of eight years. And indeed, we have the same restriction in France. Uh, it's now forbidden to uh, breed females depending on their breed, but after the age of six or seven years. So we have exactly the same situation. Um, and you see that also uh, we have to take into account how many litters has been born from this female and uh, also the way uh, the litters have been born because due to animal welfare restriction, animal welfare concern, um, in many countries there are some limitations uh, on the number of C-sections that can be performed on a given beach. When uh, we, we consider breeding a female, it's very important also to ask about the abnormalities that have been observed in the previous litters. If here you have uh, the example of a small uh, savanna kitten um, who, who died uh, at the age of four days, and you see that he was, was uh, affected by uh, a malformation without any uh, anus and only one uh, hole here, it was a vulva, and indeed there was a cloaca on these animals and it is an abnormality that has been uh, described several times in, in kittens called uh, partial rectal septum malformation. We know that uh, this uh, syndrome has a genetic compound, so indeed when we spoke with the breeder she said that she already uh, got the same abnormality with the same dam. So meaning that the conclusion is that this dam should be um, uh, excluded from reproduction. So um, there, thereafter we will try to examine the female long before reproduction. So we will go to have a look to hairs, teeth, skin and especially to be sure that there is no infectious uh, sites on, on, on these sites uh, because uh, I will give you some words again on that point later but it's very important to avoid the exposition of newborns to bacteria and so since the beach will leak as a puppy or the kittens, it's very important to have a look to uh, the teeth and it's also very important to have a look to the skin because the newborns will come in close contact with, uh, with the skin. Thereafter, we have to examine the mammary glands just in order to be sure that from an anatomical point of view, they are really able to be suckled by um, the puppies and kittens. And it's especially the, the case for the beach. We had uh, last week the case of a breeder uh, who came with um, uh, puppies that um, didn't uh, um, suckle any milk and uh, they died and the only reason was that uh, the mammary gland was um, hidden by the, within the skin and uh, nobody had a look to uh, the female before. It's also important to have a look to abnormalities that can make reproduction or pregnancy more complex. It's the case uh, for skeleton abnormalities, for lameness that can make the pregnancy more difficult to be uh, supported by the female. In case of umbilical hernia, it's also very important to uh, cure it surgically before pregnancy, long before pregnancy, just in order to avoid trouble at uh, whelping because the abdominal pressure will increase, so it has to be closed before. And also to have a look to vaginal abnormalities, especially to be sure that mating will be possible without difficulties and after that whelping will be possible without difficulties. The, 
the dam as a future dam will also have to be checked for endocrine diseases, especially uh, diabetes mellitus and also hypothyroidism. Uh, because endocrine diseases may decrease the chance for pregnancy, so it has to be at least cured before uh, pregnancy. And the animals has also to be checked for any diseases that can be frequent in the given breed, um, just in order to avoid the transmission to uh, the progeny. So, and I will give a word about overweight, but for example, uh, the, all uh, the females should be checked, for example, in Dalmatian, uh, that should be controlled for the presence of deafness. Uh, you can also check for hip dysplasia, for some pathologies of kidneys, some pathology of the, the eyes, uh, just in order to, to know whether your um, dam uh, could transmit these abnormalities to uh, our progeny. And in France, but uh, I'm sorry, I, I realized uh, preparing this uh, lecture that uh, this site is not translated at all in English, but it's just to show you that it's possible to get very interesting information. Uh, this website um, for each disease evaluates the risk of transmission of a given disease because as you know there is no genetic test for any disease but we are always very interested to know whether there is any risk for transmitting the disease to uh, the progeny so whether it's so such a good idea to mate this given female expressing i don't know uh, sub abnormalities of uh, um, of eyebrows and so on so uh, it, it's possible to have uh, an evaluation of the genetic risk of transmission, even if there isn't any test to, to check the disease. And um, here, as you can see, I have added two other criteria that should be checked on the reproductive female. First, it's behavior in, uh, in yellow. Um, because we know that if the animal is not well balanced from a behavioral point of view, there is a high risk for cannibalism of the newborn and there is also a, a high risk of difficulties of socialization in puppies and kittens, meaning that it's very important to uh, treat any behavioral troubles in the mother before reproduction in order to avoid any behavioral troubles in the progeny. And I, what is also very important to control is the body condition score of the, the female. Because here we were interested to see whether there was any um, influence of the body condition score um, on the um, viability of the progeny in, in the pitch. So here in red you have obese um, bitches, in green you have either lean bitches or bitches in an ideal weight and you can see that if the animal is obese the prevalence of low birth weight puppies is markedly increased and all these puppies are at higher risk of neonatal mortality. And on the right part of the slide you have uh, the, the calculation of the mortality over the two first days of life depending on whether the puppies are born from obese bitches or form for a normal bitches. And you see that the mortality rate is really, really markedly increased when the animal was obese, even at the time of mating. And there is no uh, modern demonstration of that um, influence in the queen, but I, 
I found in literature a publication that seems to uh, indicate that the situation is very similar in the queen. Here you have in, um, it, it is a um, queen colony, an experimental colony of domestic short hair queens. So they all belong to the same breed. So meaning that we can uh, suppose that if the weight is higher, um, the, these animals may be uh, uh, with uh, a higher body condition score than the lighter ones. And if you go there on the percentage of mortality in kittens, you can see that in the heaviest uh, females, you have a much higher uh, mortality rate in their kittens. And it's the same with when it is calculated in terms of the percentage of litters experiences losing, experiencing losses. Uh, so meaning that uh, whatever we are considering bitches or queens, we have to fight against um, overweight even before mating. One reason may be that uh, in the adipose tissue, there is a secretion of a specific uh, factor called leptin and it is well known that leptin is first interfering with uh, the very basic uh, hormones controlling reproduction meaning that uh, when animals are fat the ovulation rates and the fertilization rates are decreased meaning that uh, chances for even getting them pregnant is decreased and second, leptin is responsible for inflammation, uh, especially during the, especially within the uterus, meaning that um, there is an impaired embryonic and phasal development. And at the end, but it is out of the scope of this lecture, um, the presence of leptin uh, is also, and the presence also of fat within the myometrium, the, the, the muscles uh, um, of, uh, of the uterus is responsible for decreased uterine contractions and dystopia. And what is impressive is to see how frequent is overweight even in purebred population of dogs. So I'm sure that you as, as, a, as royal canine participants or, or, um, or collaborators, you are even more aware that than I could be about that point. But uh, whatever the country, the figures are are quite similar, meaning that we have always around 4% of purebred young dogs uh, or bees and around 20% of uh, the, the dogs that are even overweight. So here it's uh, more than 1,000 uh, French purebred dogs. We have done than, that uh, experiments uh, over the two last years, so meaning that is very recent. And here you find other results for other teams working in the Netherlands, in also uh, Alex German uh, in the UK, uh, who found exactly uh, roughly the same figures. And the situation is very similar or even worse perhaps in, uh, in the queen with around 5% of reproductive queens that are obese and nearly half uh, who are overweight. So meaning that there is really a very important um, communication to be done on that point because um, as I often say to, to our breeders that uh, they are losing money by two ways. The first one is that they are losing money because reproductive performances are decreased in their overweight animals. And second is that they pay for kibbles uh, that would not have been necessary.
So it's very important to control the body condition score long before mating, just in order to have time to um, allow for uh, weight loss before uh, reaching the time of reproduction. And uh, we, we also uh, um, conduct some experiment to compare the real body condition score of the animal and the body condition score as evaluated by the owner. And it was impressive to see that uh, a large proportion of uh, owners here were um, underestimating the real body condition score of their animal, meaning that a veterinary control, an external control is of great importance. Um, in dogs, and as it is done in other species, it has been suggested that in case of the female uh, of, of underweight female, it could be a good idea to perform a flushing, meaning that uh, the um, proportion of energy could be slightly increased in into the diet, just in order to stimulate the ovary function that is very, very dependent from the energy provision. But the real demonstration of the efficacy of this procedure uh, is done in many species, but to my knowledge, not on uh, beaches and queens, so it should be done, but um, but from a clinical experience, it, it seems to be efficient. So uh, we will sorry, we will uh, give some words about uh, about genetics and what could be done. I'm not a geneticist, but so it's very easy to perform genetic testing, and we we have the habit every month to organize uh, online surveys uh, for our French breeders and we have around 400 to 500 uh, breeders answering just in order to understand what they are doing and where are their troubles and their main limitations. And here in this survey, we asked uh, about their, um, their behavior in terms of genetic testing. And you can see that a really vast majority of them were performing genetic testing. And the, the reason was really first to avoid the diffusion of uh, mutation and to avoid diseases is in their own puppies and kittens. So really it's a widespread uh, habit, it's a good habit. And they really take into account the results of um, the genetic test in order to plan the mating. So in case of uh, the willingness of mating a positive animal, meaning an animal that bears a, a, a bad gene, they really uh, take that into account to mate with an animal in them of the same mutation. So really it's very, very, uh, it's, it's a very useful information. Um, Apart from um, the detection of genetic diseases, in the feline species there is a specificity, meaning that all females before reproduction uh, should be uh, bred grouped. Here you have, it's very simple to be done. Uh, it just need to be, it, it could be done either on DNA or even just in blood. So here it's a, it's a test on blood. And the danger in terms of reproduction comes from um, B female. So the idea is that when a female is from the group B, she's able spontaneously to produce antibodies uh, directed against uh, another uh, epitope called 
uh, A. Uh, so I, I missed something. Um, when when we say it's very similar to uh, the human situation. Um, indeed, the difference between B animal and E animal uh, is on erythrocytes, uh, meaning the, the red blood cells. Here, I, I just make a small drawing. It, it um, no, I'm sorry, I, I want, I would like to explain you correctly, but uh, I, I just uh, missed one slide. So, um, when the animal is A, he bears this type of epitope on the red blood cell. If the animal is B, he has a very different epitope. So the animal, when she, when the female is B, is producing anti-A antibody in her blood. But it's not dangerous for herself because she doesn't bear the, the round epitope. So the difficulty is that since she's producing these antibodies in her blood, she will produce these anti-A antibodies in her colostrum. So meaning that if the kitten is born with the A group, he will, uh, he will absorb with uh, the colostrum antibodies directed against the A epitope responsible for uh, the destruction of the red blood cells. If the kitten is group AB, it's the same situation because he's bearing the B epitope, but also the A epitope, and so the erythrocytes will be destroyed. And only B kitten will remain safe um, when they are born. And um, when so these anti-A antibodies are uh, recognizing the A epitope and uh, are destroyed. Hemoglobin is released within the serum of uh, the kitten, meaning that uh, we are able to see orange kittens, so either on the, on the pose or on the nose. And later, several weeks later, you can see some necrosis of the tip of the tails or of the tip of the ears. So it's the reason why it's very important not to mate a B female with a male bearing the A epitope because in that case whatever uh, the genetic situation of the male in all cases it is possible for um, uh, for uh, um, a kitten to be born so that's why it's really of great importance to know before reproduction whether a queen is a, A, B, or B, because in case she is B, it's totally, it's not totally impossible to mate with a A male, but it's important to know that because it's better to choose a B male in order to avoid the birth of uh, A kittens, or if a a male is chosen, in that case, it will need a very specific neonatal management, meaning that it will be totally forbidden for the kittens to uh, ingest, to suckle the colostrum, meaning that the kittens will have to be separated fro from the mother uh, during uh, at least the first 24 hours. So that's why it's very important for um, uh, a queen to be uh, to, to to be grouped based on uh, on on their blood. 
Right now, there are some systems to have a complete genetic evaluation, including the blood type. Here you have the, the blood type, and uh, with this type of uh, uh, genome-wide analysis, it's possible to have a really comprehensive um, a profile of each animal. Yeah. So, we will go right now to uh, aspect related to contaminant, the viral risk, the bacterial risk, and also the risk related to parasites. So the number of uh, viruses that are known to affect reproductive performance is finally relatively limited. You see that in, in, in queens, we have five main viruses. Uh, we are able to vaccinate the animals against four of them. And in uh, the beach, we have three main viruses and with uh, the ability to vaccinate against one. But what is very important to understand is that we know probably a very limited number of uh, pathogens responsible for uh, embryonic loss. And uh, so meaning that in, in a great number of cases, we are totally unable to have a specific diagnosis when there are um, repro infectious reproductive losses, but probably because we don't know enough about viruses responsible for uh, reproductive losses. So what is advised uh, in order to preserve the female from any viral viral contamination, it's either to repeat testing, and it's the case, for example, against FELV or FIV viruses in the queen, uh, for which um, owners uh, collect blood uh, in order to um, search for antibodies, just in order to be sure that the queen is not contaminated. Uh, the, rep the reproductive females has to be isolated, especially when the time of estrus is, uh, is approaching. It's important also to advise uh, a strict control at introduction, just in order to see whether uh, females and males also are um, contaminated and excreting some viruses. And it's important also to um, advise for vaccination before mating. And here you have the results of another survey to French breeders. And you can see that only one third of them is adapting the time of the booster administration uh, before uh, the mating. Whether um, it it, I would have expected this figure to, to have been higher than that. The reason why is this uh, slide is that it's very important to boost the immunity of the female against all the pathogens that could affect the pro reproduction and especially who could affect the um, neonatal survival. The reason is that when you vaccinate a queen of a beach very close to the estrus, she will produce a higher proportion of antibodies against specific pathogens you are targeting, meaning that so you are able first to protect fetuses, but you are also able to increase the immune quality of colostrum and later of milk. So thanks to vaccination very close to the estrus, it's possible to increase the proportion of really interesting antibodies protecting uh, new first fetuses and later uh, newborns. And for most vaccines we have, 
it's nearly impossible to vaccinate during pregnancy because uh, uh, the um, uh, vaccine could induce abortion or embryonic mortality. And that's why we have to vaccinate as close as possible to parturition. Since it's forbidden during pregnancy, we are uh, trying to boost, to, to inject the booster very close to uh, the oestrus. The idea is that if you increase the production of the very interesting antibodies uh, in the female, um, these antibodies will be stored during the within the mammary gland during pregnancy and especially during the last weeks of pregnancy. And at the time of queening or whelping, they will be released into uh, the colostrum. So it's very important to increase good quality antibodies here to have an appropriate storage during the pregnancy of antibodies within the mammary gland to get a good colostrum. And even later, thanks to the vaccination, to have specific antibodies produced in the milk that are also very important to protect the newborn. Going to uh, the bacterial risk, there are, a lot, there are a large number of bacteria that could affect reproduction. Um, but I will give a word about only uh, some of them. And um, I would like to share with you new information about Brucella. Brucella is a, a, an old bacteria for ruminants, but there is uh, currently a European survey trying to evaluate the prevalence of uh, Brucella in dogs. And you see that uh, in, in a lot of countries, finally, uh, the prevalence is not so low. So at that time, we do not search very often for Brucella, but perhaps is it an emerging disease decreasing the reproductive performance in dogs? At least uh, we, we should have uh, this in mind. From a practical point of view, and uh, considering the bacterial risk, it's, it's uh, important to ask about the diet and especially to be cautious about uh, raw meat diets. Because I, I put here the prevalence of the contamination of both uh, diets for pathogenic bacteria responsible for abortion in, uh, in the in beaches and queens. And uh, you can see that the risk of contamination of both diets is really very high for a large number of uh, abortive agents. Um, there are two origins Two, two, factor, res, two factors responsible for the uh, high proportion of uh, raw meat diets contaminated by uh, these pathogens. The first reason is that um, very often the origin of raw food is not so good, meaning that uh, the, it's, um, um, it can come from non-controlled uh, carcasses and uh, pieces of meat. But most of the time is due to the way of preservation, especially in terms of uh, freezing and sowing the meat. And it's really uh, um, a point on which we have to be uh, very, very cautious. Uh, so apart from raw food in terms of bacteria, um, the global hygiene of, um, of the place of life is also very important. Uh, we have to take care about teeth, skin and hairs, are, are, as I said before. And it is also uh, important to fight against the systematic antibiotic prevention that is very open seen in the field, meaning that uh, uh, some beaches especially are given antibiotics from 
us through to whelping and even after during the first month after whelping and it's not a rational a prudent use of uh, antibiotic but conversely it's very important to have a look to the teeth and to organize the scaling to schedule the scaling long before estrus in order to have a clean uh, mouse uh, at, at the time of uh, of whelping a question very often um, asked about the bacterial risk is the interest of vaginal bacteriology and the answer is not so easy but um, what is important to understand that the, is that the vaginal cavity is normally full of a lot of different strains of bacteria so this situation is totally normal but this one is not meaning that if you are able to cultivate only one or two types of bacteria from a vaginal sample in that situation indeed it's important to um, perhaps to give antibiotics in but only in this type of, uh, of situation because it's not normal that only one strain of bacteria has, has uh, succeeded into destroying all the other bacteria it's not possible for one strain to become dominant to have uh, a balanced uh, flora within the vagina uh, a recurrent question is about the pathogenic uh, role of mycoplasma. It's totally normal from what we know to find mycoplasma in bitches. In, so at that time, it's not possible to make any uh, demonstration of the fact that finding mycoplasma in the vaginal cavity could be a reason to treat the female. So I know that in the field is very, very often done, at least in France, it's often done. And uh, the bitch are given very um, critical antibiotics in that case. But indeed, nobody has at that time proven that uh, it is linked with infertility, abortion or neonatal mortality. And to conclude at that point, it's also important for vet uh, surgeon to realize that um, being able to observe bacteria on vaginal smears performed at the time of oestrus is not at all a sign of any pathology. So it's totally normal that bacteria are present within the bacterial cavity and it's totally normal to be able to see them on vaginal smears. Um, we have seen viruses, bacteria and right now parasites. So indeed uh, the habit is to uh, deworm the female at the time of estrus but it, it's it's not due to any pathogenic role of parasites on ovaries for example on on fertilization it's just due to the fact that if the female is clean from a parasitic point of view before the estrus uh, he, he, she will be also clean during the beginning of pregnancy until the time of the, the, the sixth week at which also we, we deworm a second time. So either we organize the targeting, targeted deworming if we know the parasites from coproscopy, but at least it's better to have uh, the normal deworming applied on on the on all the animals, so including the animals involved into reproduction. Um, so we will finish on the possibility to control the ovarian cycle. Um, first, to prepare reproduction meaning that to be in good conditions to have really cy cycles and 
it's it's important to avoid factors that could inhibit cyclicity. Uh, it's a case for uh, intensive hunting, uh, intensive sport, um, especially for us kids uh, running, and um, all these um, physical activities, sports are susceptible to inhibit the oestrus uh, in, in, in the beach uh, for two reasons. The first one is that um, it will decrease uh, the percentage of fat within the body of the female and uh, it's important, it's crucial indeed for uh, to get uh, oestrus to for a female to have enough fat because um, indeed it's a matter of survival meaning that the reproduction is possible only is if the female um, has enough fat to be able to support pregnancy so if you get a too lean female she will not come into estrus and sometimes uh, customers come with uh, the complaint of no estrus and we just ask them from stopping running with the bitch and uh, it's magic. Uh, she she is able to to come uh, in into estrus uh, just several weeks uh, later. So it's first uh, a matter of uh, fat mass, and it is also a matter of stress, because we know uh, from from human experience that uh, stress is a main inhibitor of uh, female cyclicity. Um, to to improve also uh, the chance to get a female into estrus, it's important to have a look to diet. And going back to uh, bath, I will share with you this this case of uh, a pincher uh, coming that described with uh, an estrus. So she she was uh, two or three years old and she had never been seen in estrus. And the clinician discovered that she was uh, uh, suffering from a too high uh, quantity of uh, thy thyroid hormones. And she, the reason for this hyperthyroidism was the uh, bath diet due to uh, the fact due to the place at which the meat pieces were collected it was there was coming from um, the region indeed i don't know the english word uh, it's it's a place around the the thyroid uh, from uh, from the carcass of uh, of cows and it's a low price pieces and um, several times it has been described that if we use this type of uh, meat pieces, uh, the, the diet is totally contaminated by thyroidic hormones coming from the cow, and um, meaning that it will uh, contribute to hyperthyroidism uh, into uh, the bitches. When uh, the, this bitch will when the, when the diet of this beach has been changed to commercial dog food, at that time she came into estrus and thereafter she will be able to give birth to five puppies. So it's another reason also to have a look to uh, the diet before uh, estrus to be sure that the female is in good condition to come into estrus. It's also possible to uh, medically control, especially to induce the, the estrus thanks to in, in beaches and in queens, thanks to uh, um, a drug called desloreline. It's a generic 
agonists that we can put under the skin. And uh, this system will allow to induce uh, astrosis in order to get an astrosis earlier or at least at a more suitable moment. And um, we, we just wanted to see how efficient it was and whether it was possible to advise the use of this hormone. And um, we arrived to two conclusions. Here you see that finally the whelping rates of implanted or non-implanted bitches were very similar. but it was the case only in multiparous bitches. If you try to induce astrosis with the same hormone in nulliparous bitches, in that situation, uh, you don't get really nearly no pregnancy. So the message that has to be taken from this experiment is that it's very efficient, but it has to be restricted to multiparous bitches in order to get uh, good results. And another interesting information from uh, this uh, experiment was that even if we were using a GnRH agonist, there was no effect on litter size because we were afraid of increasing the size of the litter until getting very small puppies and so increasing the mortality rate within the litter. But indeed, it's not the case. There is no effect on the litter size and there is no effect either on the mortality rate within the litter. So meaning that this only can be used safely in order to get uh, astrosis from uh, from from the from the beach. Um, so we have spoken a lot about the female, but it is also very important to give a small preparation to the male. So. Uh, in the influence of the age of the male is very, very limited, meaning that we didn't see any effect on of the age of the male on uh, the whelping rate. So it's a case for uh, the male dog and we had the same situation for the town cat. So the age of the male has not so much importance uh, to get uh, to, to optimize reproduction. And we didn't evidence any impact on the age of the male on prolificacy either. So the only advice we could have is to uh, organize, especially in, especially in dogs, we we have to collect semen just in order to uh, be sure that the quality of the semen is good enough for the animal to be mated. And it is also very important to ask to the owner of the male uh, how many females have been mated before and uh, how many litters were obtained uh, and also whether any abnormalities have has been observed within the litter, just in order to evaluate the, um, for the real in vivo fertility of, of the animal. The difficulty is that the semen collection is hardly feasible in tomcats. It usually requires an anesthesia, and so that's why it's, it, it is usually not performed. But it's very easy to be done in uh, male dogs. So long before uh, planning a mating with a male dog, such evaluation of the semen should be organized. Nevertheless, the female part of the story, the female contribution uh, of uh, the pro reproduction performances is much higher than the contribution of, of the male. So we now uh, reached the end of this presentation. So we, as you have seen there are a lot of things to be done before mating in order to optimize reproductive performances.
but it is not the end of the story after uh, after just preparing females and males uh, to reproduction there are also many steps that have to be controlled uh, through follow-up mating management pregnancy parturition and also a great uh, control on the first days uh, of life so reproduction is a long story uh, if you want to to know more uh, we we have uh, uh, websites and a lot of uh, online tools that you could use they are translated uh, in english so here you have uh, the address of our website and uh, we have opened uh, what is called the neocare library and on the neocare library you could find either for breeding for dogs and for cats uh, a lot of uh, chapters and in each chapters you will be able to gain access for free to a lot of um, uh, data and uh, we also have a YouTube channel in which uh, you will find some lectures either in French or, or in English if you want to know more on reproduction and especially on, um, on, on breeding and on uh, neonatology and, uh, and pediatrics. Thank you for your patience and attention. Thank you, Sylvie. That was really, really interesting and really comprehensive. Um, much obliged. Thank you. Um, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find my screen. OK, here we go. So I'm just going to focus, um, not for very long actually, on um, just the general principles of nutrition because as Sylvie did briefly mention, that does play a small part um, in optimal health, not just in uh, our, our sort of day-to-day -day animals, but from our breeding animals too. And I just think it's just important to be reminded that um, there is nutrient requirements it's, it is a legal requirement that cats and dogs do receive nutrients in certain levels um, and we are very guided by the nrc and guided by afco the association of american feed control officials and fediaf the european pet food industry um, to make sure that we are making food um, no matter which company you're from adhering to these rules and the food needs to be complete and balanced. Uh, dogs and cats need around 40 nutrients, um, water, fat, protein, but you can see here it really is a very complex puzzle and there's a lot to take into account. So making a food um, that delivers the right levels of the right nutrients at the right time is critical. And if you're looking at really optimum health, you have to take this into account as well. And just here in the UK, we have the PFMA, the Pet Food Manufacturing Association, and they are an authority in the UK in pet nutrition and is the principal trade body. So they do represent the UK pet food industry and they've got over 70 members from different companies. And that um, it doesn't matter what your approach is. When you do sign up to the PFMA, you are adhering to the guidelines around what nutrient requirements cats and dogs do have. And we aim to be a real credible voice of a responsible pet food industry. Um, the PFMA over the years have really started to crack down on lots of different elements of um, food safety, optimum nutrition, and we're really proud to be associated with that industry. And if you can see here, I'm just going to move my screen, sorry. Um, when you think about the UK pet population, 9 million dogs and 8 million cats and obviously fish, rabbits, all sorts of different um, small furries as well. There are an awful lot of animals to think about feeding and thinking about what they do eat and how they do eat that. Um, and shockingly, we've got some statistics here when it comes to um, 
sorry. My screen isn't playing very well, okay. Um, when we look at pet, how pet owners approach feeding their animals, there really isn't um, uh, a scientific process behind it when you look at the statistics around it. Only 37% of pet owners really know how to check their pet's weight, which, as Sylvie discussed, when it comes to leptin and when it comes to breeding successfully, we really need to start thinking about those things. Um, over a third of pet owners use human foods to treat. Again, it's not taking into account the whole holistic package of what I should be feeding my animal, how much I should be feeding my animal to make sure that they're at their optimal weight. There's an awful lot for pet owners to, um, to realise when it comes to nutrition and it really is our job to show them the, the way um, and educate them in the way to do it. I'm having fun and games with my presentation. My apologies for this. Nope, it's still not wanting to move on. Bear with me. Okay, sorry, I'm back now. Um, and we're thinking about uh, nutrients and especially essential nutrients, as I said, they do need to be in the right levels at the right time, really targeting lots of different areas of um, life stage, lifestyle and those things. Um, and we can identify that protein, fat, minerals and vitamins are essential nutrients. Carbohydrates aren't essential, but they are really useful within the diet and obviously not forgetting water as well. So they're all measured very, very differently in different levels. Um, and dogs and cats are composed of many different systems that require nutrients for just normal metabolism and for optimal health. So just thinking simply about the levels of fatty acids in there, notably DHA, which we know is essential for neurological development. Protein, which is so important in the lean muscular frame in the right levels again, um, or when we're thinking about protein and we're thinking about pregnancy in the right levels there too. Amino acids, so taurine, L-carnitine for cardiac health, all of those things that amino acids can profile to ensure that we are delivering optimal nutrition. Um, water, which is obviously involved in every process in the body. Vitamins and minerals, which are involved in many different processes around the body, again, in the right levels at the right time. What are we looking at growing at that time? Are we looking at skeletal growth? Are we looking at muscular growth? So really, really significant, making sure we're getting the nutrients in the right levels. And nutrients don't equate to ingredients. It's really difficult to look at a bag of food and see ingredients and see how that equates to nutrients. So really do bear in mind when selecting the diet for your bitch um, to make sure that you are considering are they getting the right level of nutrients in the right levels. And we have three simple questions that we do say to ask of your food. Is it safe? So in, in terms of manufacturing processes, is it safe? Is it robust? Are you able to ask questions about the manufacturing process? Are you able to um, pinpoint very certain nutrients that went into that food at a certain stage of time? Um, is there a veterinary board certified nutritionist who formulates your food or do you have an R&D department? Who devises the recipes? Are they fully AF compliant? There are so many questions that you should be able to ask of a pet food company and they should be able to answer it for you. And I dare say if you do really, really um, want your animals to be in the optimum health, then do call these companies. Do find out the information that you want to find out about the food that you're feeding them and is it safe? And as I said, it's important to remember that dogs and cats do require nutrients, not necessarily ingredients. So we look and look at the amino acid profile of meat versus the amino acid profile of wheat gluten. And we can see it's the same. So where they're getting that amino acid from isn't really um, the important thing. It's the quality and it's the digestibility of that amino acid. Is it serving its purpose within the body? 
is the food complete and balanced or is it complementary? So are you really trying to have a go at yourself at balancing the diet? And if so, if we think about the first slide that I showed you, are all those nutrients in the right levels? It's a really difficult thing to do. Lots of people aren't able to balance their own diets, let alone that of their cats and their dogs. So making sure that it is complete and balanced, I think really gives you a peace of mind. Um, and if it's not complete, then it really shouldn't make up more than 10% of the diet. And again, useful questions to ask. And this is according to Wasava, the Nutritional Assessment Toolkit, which is a fantastic um, toolkit. It really gets to the bottom of the animal that's in front of you. So what's its body condition? Is it neutered? Which life stage is it? How much exercise? Does it have any med medical conditions? And you can download this here. So if you really want to start thinking about what you're feeding your animal and the importance of nutrition, this will really help to guide you in the right direction, whether that's for a, um, a bitch that you'd like to start breeding from, or if it's just a, a pet that you've got or for whatever, you can really apply these principles. So is it safe? Is it nutritious and is it right for this pet? What are questions that we would encourage you to ask of any pet food company? So we've got a few minutes now for our Q and A's with Sylvie. So again, thank you, Sylvie, for a really comprehensive lecture. Um, we really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed listening. It was it was very comprehensive. It covered a lot, but it was really interesting um, to hear your perspective. So I shall hand over to Vicky, who's now going to ask Sylvie some questions. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Sylvie. I have to say we've been completely overwhelmed with questions. Um, to the point that I'm not even sure I've managed to read them all in order to ask them to Sylvie. So uh, apologies, because I know there's going to be a lot of you who've sent questions through that we're not going to ask this evening, um, but we will get back to you. So we will email you a response. So don't think that we're ignoring you. We've just been completely overwhelmed by the uh, positive responses to this evening's webinar. So I have managed to pick through just a couple because there's been so many interesting ones that have come through. So just to, uh, if Sylvie's still there and still with us, then um, uh, we've had some quite interesting ones about timings of when to mate um, the bitch, especially if it's for her first mating. You know, there's some quite conflicting advice out there about whether it should be um, waiting until she's had one or two or even three heats. Is there any more recent advice about when is the optimum time for that first mating? Um, in, in, indeed, it's, it's something like a, a, a tradition, but it, it's not... Um, the important point is not the the number of eats uh, um, uh, exhibited by the females, uh, whatever it's the first, second, or third at not such a great importance. But the reason why it has often been said that uh, a bitch should, should be bred on um, uh, the third one, it is just because at that time, uh, we, in all breeds, we are nearly sure that the female has completed her own growth. And um, and it it may indeed it's one of the most important points uh, because um, if if you uh, breed the animals after um, the end of her own growth, it means that uh, the pelvis would have uh, get its uh, uh, highest development and uh, you will have uh, the, uh, a limited risk for dystopia and it was only the reason. But from an ovarian point of view or for an uterine point of view, it has no importance. So it's the importance, it's the age, but the age in the specific breed you are considering and taking into account the time uh, required to uh, complete growth. Is it clear for you? <laughs> yes, I think that's very clear. Making sure that the uh, the bitch is mature enough is, is, the, yeah. is the real priority. And obviously that varies so greatly 
between our breeds so you know like you said one one answer is not not clear for everybody you cannot give a specific age as such or a specific heat so I think that's that's a really clear answer. We've also had um, some requests for more information for what would you recommend for dams that have not had a litter in several years? So it wouldn't be that they're having their first litter later in life, but perhaps they had one at maybe you know, 18 months, two years of age, but then for whatever reason, they are not having another litter until a few years later. Is there anything in particular that should be taken into consideration in that circumstance? Uh, no, not no, no specific recommendation. Uh, I think ju just to say that the oldest is a bitch. Uh, you, 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 if she, if she, no. The important thing is is just to avoid reproduction globally after the age of uh, of six year. But in the meanwhile, if she she has been mated once very young, and thereafter she is something like four or five years old and you still want another pregnancy, okay, th there is no contraindication and you have to follow what is described here and especially what is important is to be sure that she she didn't, uh, um, she's not overweight at the time you want to breed her, but there is no, really there is no specific uh, recommendation. Okay, that's great. And it's interesting that you were mentioning there again about um, the risk factor of the dam being overweight. Uh, but you also mentioned that there is a, a link between uh, an extremely low body fat percentage and the difficulties with breeding as well. And so we've had a few people asking about breeds with a naturally low body fat percentage. Are these breeds um, more inclined to, to be more difficult when it comes to coming into estrus and having issues with less regular seasons? No, in, in, indeed, we it's 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 a really it's a good question. It's it's a, from from a, a larger perspective is um, it's it's a. Uh, the, the difficulty is indeed the analysis of a raw value of body condition score and indeed if you compare a greyhound to uh, a bull mastiff obviously from from the ideal body condition score is not the same one between the two breeds and to answer this question uh, no i uh, from from what i I can understand um, with the selection, we have selected breeds with different percentage of fat and um, and but there is something like um, an adaptation of the breed to its own, physiological body fat, meaning that to get into estrus, the percentage of fat required by a greyhound female is much lower than the one required for a Labrador female to get into estrus. So no, it's, it's a, an adaptation um, it's an adaptation, so meaning that uh, the minimal threshold of body fat uh, required to come into estrus depends on the breed you are considering. That would make perfect sense. Okay, maybe I think time for just one more question before we close the webinar. So we have had uh, what I think is quite an interesting question about chemical neutering. Um, and whether or not that would have an impact later on with reproductive success. Um, and is there any evidence for or against or anything that you can add to that potential discussion? Yeah. Um, so is, is it, if I, we, 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 can, uh, we can speak about uh, so the, the famous uh, suprelorine, so the GnRH agonist I was speaking about at the end. So the question could be both on males or on females. I, I, I don't know uh, whether 
um, the question was asked on one sex or it on both, asked but on both, on both. Okay, on both. Okay, so um, f from so um, the the product is officially licensed only for male dogs, and so all the other data are coming from scientific literature but are not covered and guaranteed at all by the, the lab producing the drug. F from, from our experience and from scientific literature, so if you use this drug to inhibit cyclicity, it's a really a very potent drug but what is important is to um, to insert the, the implant uh, very early in anastrus or even in diastrus, just in order to avoid the implant to induce astrosis. Thereafter, what is very, the main um, the main trouble, the main limitation when using this drug is that we are totally unable to predict the duration of efficacy of the implant. So we don't know whether we will inhibit the oestrus during six weeks, during six months, sorry, or during one year and a half. And the situation is very similar in males and in females in dogs, in the canine species and in the feline species. But if your question is to know whether after uh, the, uh, the at the end of the efficacy of the drug, how are the reproductive performances? Uh, indeed, there really seems to be very, very good. And at that time, all the experiments who report the um, reproductive success of, especially I will speak first on females, after the use of this drug are really totally normal, meaning that the females are able first to come back to cyclicity and to have normal fertility, so normal, normal um, whelping rates, queening rates and also totally normal uh, prolificacy. Uh, on males, uh, we have to be perhaps more prudent because as I said, the drug is officially licensed for male dogs and in male dogs, it is written in the recommendations for use that um, the lab guarantees the fertility, the back to fertility in only 95 to 98, depending on the dosage you use, 95 to 98% of the males are supposed to be fertile uh, 18 months after the administration of the implant. It does not mean that they will never come back to fertility, but at least later than after, uh, it's two years after. And we have to be especially prudent if we want to use this product in non-pubertal uh, male dogs or even male cats, because we, we, we do not have any, we do not have animal series large enough to be sure of the long-term consequences of the use of this product. Um, so meaning that finally in females, we do not see any long-term consequences and in males, perhaps it's just a matter of time for the males to come back to fertility, but you have to, 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 be, uh, to be prudent. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for your comprehensive answers, Sylvie, and thank you much for your absolutely brilliant webinar. The response has been so positive. It's been a really enjoyable evening and I certainly have learned a lot. So thank you very much for your time. So that's it from us this evening, everybody. Thank you to Sylvie.